reflection is from Henry Van Nelly. If we think that a little, uh, excuse me, <laughs> now you can hear me. If we think that a little praying can't do any harm, we will soon find that it can't do much good either. Prayer has meaning only if it is necessary and indispensable. Prayer is prayer only when we can say that without it, we cannot live. Welcome everyone to Webster Presbyterian Church, all who are here worshiping in person and those on Zoom and Facebook. We are happy that you are worshiping with us this morning. We have a few announcements that you will also find in your bulletin for you know, more details. But in particular, uh, please remember this coming Wednesday evening, uh, an additional Learning for a Lifetime. Um, there will be a third in a four-part series on Healthy Boundaries Awareness Training for the Congregation, led by Reverend Dr. Janice Lee Fitzgerald. All of us are encouraged to participate on Zoom starting at 7 p.m. Please come, even if you have missed some of the earlier um, sessions. Each one offers new insights. Also, we are now collecting gently used and new men's, children's, and women's summer clothing for the clothing house at Cameron Community Ministries in, in downtown Rochester. Collection tubs will be outside the north door of the church in the narthex and in the upper hallway from now until June 14th. Also, please remember the Sunday worship team. They need additional friends and helpers with the virtual Sunday services. Train, I'm told training is easy and available. So please see Alyssa Mayer or Todd Fargo if you are willing to be part of the effort to keep the Zoom services continuing. Thank you. You may remain seated to sing, There's a Sweet, Sweet Spirit. call to worship as we read responsively. We come and seek the ways of wisdom. We come to find peace and songs of love. Come, let us worship. Life-giving God, your love and light guides, guides us on the path of courage, compassion, generosity, and grace. Lead us as we seek to follow your transformative love that turns sorrow into joy and despair into hope. Oh God, help us embrace your guiding love that calls us to live as your faithful witnesses who reflect your grace and redemptive love. Amen. 
God, open hearts to receive your gracious love and strengthen us to carry the good news of your healing power found in the light, love, and life of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn is for the beauty of the earth, number 473 in your hymnal. Now let us unite in the prayer of confession. Gracious God, we confess our doubts that stifle our joy. Forgive us when we lack faith in you and comfort us when our fears outweigh our praise. God, forgive us when we fail to trust you and help us when we do not live as your faithful witnesses. Guiding God, forgive us when we are self-consumed and lack the time needed to serve our neighbors. O oh God, hear our prayers of confession and forgiveness and guide us from disbelief and distress by leading us into your hope-filled joy. God, we need your loving spirit to be among us, to comfort us in our doubt, and to strengthen us in our faith. Amen. Please stand for the glory of Patri.
Well, hi, boys and girls. I brought some things today. Mrs. Galen let me borrow these. So, um, and I have a towel here, and I'm going to put it on the table, and I'm going to try to build a house out of my blocks. Okay, so let's get started, right? Oh, uh, here we go. Let's get some more out of here. Oh, the big ones are in the bottom, she said. There we go. There we go. You get the big ones on the bottom. And get some more. Oops. Uh, I need you guys here because, oh yeah, see all the blocks on the ground. Okay. Oh, making a mess, but it's lots of fun to play. Oh, having some trouble here. There, how's it done? Ah, can I make it bigger? Let's see. No. Okay, what's wrong here? What do you think is wrong, boys and girls? Oh, okay, I'll try it without the towel. All right. Well, the towel, <laughs> I love to throw these around. The towel reminds me, it's kind of a sandy color, kind of a light brown. And that reminds me of a story that Jesus taught about building a house on sand. And he also talked about building it on a rock. Now, this is not a rock, but it's steel and it's nice and strong. So let's see if I can build it there and if I can get my house higher. Oh, there we go. See now, boys and girls, if you come to church, you could help me do this. And I really need your help. So uh, let's see. This is getting a little higher than it was before. Yeah, that's doing it. Oh, one more over here. Thanks for waiting for me. Okay. Ooh. Put the little ones on the top. That's what my granddaughter told me. She's six. She's pretty good at this. I've only got one more. I did it. I'm all the way up to the top. Look at how much taller my, my house is. My tower is much better. And... So I think I better read that scripture so that I know what Jesus said. So I'm going to move myself. There we go. It's in Matthew 7, 24. Jesus tells his friends this parable. Now we know a parable is a story that has a good lesson for us. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is a wise person who builds his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, but it did not fall because it was on a firm foundation. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not follow them is a foolish person who builds his hand, his house on the sand. The rain came. The streams, whoops, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it crashed. Jesus wasn't just telling us how to build a house, but he was telling us that we should have a firm foundation to live a good life and to be wise. So the Bible tells us that Jesus is our cornerstone the cornerstone is on a building. 
is at the bottom where it's a firm foundation. The cornerstone is straight and level and true. And Jesus' teachings are the truth. His teachings are for us to have a wise and good life. And we need a firm foundation for a good house or for a good life. So the next time you're building a tower out of Legos or playing Jenga, make sure you have a firm foundation. But we also need Jesus in our lives to make wise decisions and to know the truth that's in the Bible. Let us pray. God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to earth to teach us how to live a good life. We will try to follow his teachings and make Jesus our cornerstone. Amen. Yay! Our first scripture reading for this morning is from Acts chapter 1, verses 15 to 17 and 21 to 26. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in his, this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the seven apostles. Our second scripture reading is Psalm number one, verses one through six. That's actually the entire Psalm. And the theme is life's two roads. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit on the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let us enjoy some special music.
before I read the scripture, I just have to tell you a brief story about uh, uh, that happened once around some music. Um, I had um, a lot of the students at the East Rochester Church, I had a lot of students from um, the Eastman School of Music, uh, you know, just, you know, young people who were at the top of their game, they would come and fill in at the service. And on one occasion, Sally, on one occasion, Sally, uh, a woman came, young lady came and sang a song. And I was so moved by the song, I said, would you do that again? Uh, <laughs> thank you, Sally, thank you, Leanne. <laughs> thank you, Sally, and thank you, thank you, Leanne. Um, our lesson this morning comes from the Gospel according to John chapter 17, verses six through 19, and it reads, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you for the words that you gave to me, I have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was guarded, I'm sorry, while I was with them, I protected them in your name. I guarded them and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost so that the scripture might be filled. But now I am coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they may be sanctified in the truth. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And the people all said together, Amen. Today, is the final Sunday of the church season of Easter. Next Sunday becomes uh, is Pentecost and following that we enter into what we know as ordinary time. The assigned lectionary lesson from the Gospel of John is a prayer of Jesus. And in some places our lesson, lesson is referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. It's uh, Michael K. Marsh, a, a Catholic priest who says of this prayer that it takes place on the night of the Last Supper. Supper has been eaten, feet have been washed, and Jesus has taught his disciples. Judas has left the table and the betrayal has begun. And now Jesus looks to heaven in prayer to God. It is the prayer of Jesus for his disciples. Based on that, I'm gonna label my remarks this morning on their behalf, on their behalf. Now, indulge me for a moment, but I first need to say that a responsible preacher or a responsible speaker ought to know that there are risks taken with every word they speak. I know the risks that, are, that I take with my words and my remarks. I know that I'm taking a chance and running the risk that you might hear a word or a phrase and tune me out. You might tune me out for any of a number of reasons. You might tune me out because 
I make a claim about the love of God that is not consistent with the claims that you make about the love of God. I might try to navigate our differences and our the differences in theology with such a person by first singing to them a song I learned as a child. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. I might try to navigate our differences by laying that as a common foundation. But one of the things that I'm learning and discovering with even greater and greater clarity is others may have learned that same song, but they learned it in an entirely different key from the one I was taught. I remember altar calls that invited people to unite their lives with Christ, where the preacher would say, you've got to choose which side you are, are on. And the choir would sing, come, come to Jesus while you still have time. Now, I'll never forget the first time I heard the word and I struggle to pronounce this correctly, but the first time I heard the word theodicity. Theodicy, theodicity is a word religious scholars use for God's sense of justice. Depending upon what part of town you were in when you went to Sunday school, theodicities differ. The theodicity of Pharaoh differs from the theodicity of Moses. Now you might wanna tune me out because you don't wanna reckon with those differences. Now, on the other hand, you might wanna tune me out because you are distracted by immediate and pressing matters of life and focusing on anything is difficult. I've had moments in life when peace was difficult to come by and life's matters pressed so hard on me that it was hard to think about anything else. It was only by finding prayer time and the prayers of others that I was able to move on. Now you might unintentionally tune me out simply because you are tired. I was once told that I should take it as a compliment when a congregant falls asleep during a sermon. I was told that a sleeping congregant is a sign of a congregant that feels safe when you are speaking and knows that everything is gonna be okay. Now I'm not totally convinced of that just yet. But if any of you choose to doze off, I'll take it as a compliment. Now, lastly, you might tune me out this morning because I've labeled my remarks on their behalf. And you have taken on their behalf to mean that there is nothing in this morning's lesson from you. Trust me. Everything about Jesus is for you and about you, everything. So our lesson is a lesson where Jesus prays to God. It is a grand prayer. Like I said, it's called Jesus High Priestly Prayer. And if you don't mind me being just a little bit critical of this text, I think John could have used an editor. But to be completely honest with you, and this just happens to be one of those Sundays when I, you know, I took the text on because it was in the lectionary and I've preached this text before, but this was this morning when, you know, I sort of felt like this text didn't lend itself to Sunday morning preaching. This is certainly a prayer that definitely needs to be studied, considered, and contemplated. But unless I gave you one of those hour-long sermons, or even greater than that, I'm not certain that I could adequately unpack all of it without you tuning me out and going to sleep because I bored you. So rather than bore you, and before I say anything else, what I want you to take from this, from my remarks this morning, what I want you to take from this lesson this morning 
is the spirit of a song we all learned as children. I know you know it. Jesus loves me, this I know, cause the Bible tells me so. That's right. You see, in exercising all the theological muscle I've got, my counsel this morning is to take these remarks around this passage from John chapter 17, verses six through nine, take with it and from it the spirit that Jesus loves me. In our prayer, Jesus prays to God on behalf of the disciples, those whom he says God gave him to care for. He knows his disciples are God's children and accept his responsibility to them. He says to God, they were yours and you gave them to me. Now, I wanna encourage everybody here to know yourselves as one of God's children for whom Jesus has taken responsibility for. Now, I think I just said something worth remembering, so I'm gonna repeat it. Know yourselves as one of God's children for whom Jesus has taken responsibility for. Come to know yourselves in the same way that Peter thought of the first followers of disciples. Peter writes that he knows disciples as a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Now, as I say that, I am always careful about language that can be used to exclude others. And some might exploit or have exploited the words of Peter in order to take advantage of others. But this morning, as I look at this prayer and label my remarks on their behalf, all I'm asking you to do is think about yourselves as someone or as a people for whom Jesus has taken responsibility for. Think of yourselves and know yourselves as a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation and God's special possession. So in this lesson, Jesus begins his prayer. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me in the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. So we could take this as a challenge. Have you kept your word? Are you living the meaning of being a chosen people? Are you living the responsibility that comes with being a chosen people called into a royal priesthood? Jesus is given testimony to God. Testimony to God that he's been faithful to his calling, faithful to those God has charged him to care for. And while in his, his care, Jesus declares to God, they have kept your word. Now, again, to be honest with you, I've got to admit that rarely do I ever turn to God to share my accomplishments. I thank God for my blessings. I try not to boast and I try to be humble. I approach God at times and depending upon the spirit, how the spirit moves, I'm the, I'm the guy who stuck with reflecting on Psalm 139. Oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Sometimes the spirit of God will remind me when I sit quietly, for my thoughts are your, not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. That's what the Lord says through, through Isaiah. Now, I don't go to God to share what I would call spiritual accomplishments, but if you feel the need to do that, go right ahead. But the truth of the matter is, that most of my trips to the throne of grace boil down to Lord help me or Lord help somebody else. Most of my conversations with God take the form of Lord have mercy on me or Lord have mercy on somebody else. You may recall the 18th chapter of Luke where Jesus tells this story. Two men went up to the temple to pray the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. 
the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The publican, standing far off, would not so much as lift up his eyes to, unto heaven, but beat upon his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy for us. But in our lesson, Jesus is taking responsibility for us. Jesus goes to God with what we call an intercessory prayer. He intercedes for us because he knows the world his disciples will face. Listen in part now to Jesus as he intercedes and offers an intercessory prayer for his disciples. Jesus' prayer goes, protect them in your name. Jesus says, my prayer is not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. You see, Jesus knows what happens when you go out into the world with, with truth based on the love and the righteousness of God. Jesus knows what happens. Jesus knows what can happen when you get out of bed and put your feet on the floor in the morning. So having claimed responsibility for us, Jesus goes before God with a prayer of inter intercession. On our behalf, Jesus prays to God, protect them, sanctify them. Now I close now reminding you that in, in, in applying all the theological, muster, theological muscle I can muster and calling upon whatever sanctified brain cells I might have, having considered Jesus' high priestly prayer, my best counsel to you to this morning is, for, is to remember the song that says, Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. Little ones, that's us. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Now, I'm just going to ask right now that you would help a preacher out and say together, amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Um, at this point now, we're going to turn to uh, our four prayers of the people. And um, Anita will solicit your joys and concerns. <laughs> If you have a prayer request, raise your hand and I will come to you. And then um, I will repeat it so that everybody online can also hear. Okay. All is well with the world. <laughs> Well, we know that we all have our, our own hurts and our own concerns. God hears those two that are in your heart. Yeah, so you're all blessed and highly favored. Okay, amen, amen. Uh, are there anything coming in online? Folks, oh, good week. Well, I, we do have a couple, uh, one prayer request that was called into the, into the office, uh, and that's for Al Granger. And Al is in the hospital with a stubborn infection following surgery. Uh, let's remember him in prayer. Uh, and I just heard this morning that Dick Dodd uh, is, uh, has been hospitalized with, I think it was a gallbladder infection. Dick's, you know, so he's hospitalized. But, so keep Dick uh, and his family uh, in prayer. Uh, let us have a moment now for just and go to God. Eternal God, we come to you right now with our heads bowed, our minds quiet, seeking that we would 
hear from you, that we might connect with you heart to heart, spirit to spirit, mind to mind, and soul to soul. That as we come to you seeking to connect with you, that you might fill each and every one of our spirits with joy. Fill each of our spirits with the joy that only you have. Fill our spirits, dear God, with the peace that passes all understanding. Help us, dear God, to know that your yoke is easy and that your burden is light. Help us to know, dear Lord, how to say simply to you, Lord, that you are Lord of Lords, that you are King of Kings. And then to you, dear Lord, Lord, we need to say thank you. We need to say thank you for all things. Thank you for the sun that shines, for the rain that falls. Thank you, dear Lord, for photosynthesis. Thank you, dear God, for the winds and the rains. Thank you, Lord, for the food that is on our table. Thank you, dear Lord, for the love that is in each and every one of our lives. Thank you, dear Lord. For as we've said many, many times, dear God, that if we had a thousand tongues, we could not adequately give you praise. So we come to you, dear Lord, praising you and thanking you for all things. But as we say thank you for all things, we would be amiss if we did not say thank you for your son, Jesus. The one who not only came and taught us how to pray, but the one who came and gave us a model of how we should pray. The one who paved the path through eternity for each and every one of us. The one who taught us that blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. So yes, dear God, we're thankful that you sent your son Jesus to walk among us and teach each and every one of us how to live. But even, dear Lord, as we come to you with praise and with thanks, we come to you as a people who sorely need you. We were quiet this morning. But you know, dear Lord, the hairs on our heads. You know, dear Lord, what lives deeply inside each and every one of our hearts and souls. Dear Lord, you know what our innermost yearnings are. So we give those to you, dear Lord, trusting that your will shall be done. Yes, dear Lord, we can give our concerns to you, but we can't be selfish, dear Lord, for we must leave this building and pray for children everywhere. We pray, dear Lord, for parents struggling with children. We pray, dear Lord, not just for children here, nearby, but we pray for children that live a town away or yet another town away, or we pray for children across this entire world, dear Lord, for children seem to have to face things that children ought not to have to face. And we pray, dear Lord, that you might bring a halt to the challenges, to the traumas that children must face these days. But as we pray for children, we pray for children who are in school. We pray for children who unfortunately find themselves locked behind bars. We pray for them, dear Lord, and we ask your blessing upon them that you might help the adults to shape a better world for them. So yes, dear Lord, we could stand here for almost eternity and just move from the schoolhouse to the jailhouse and ask, dear Lord, that you would bless those who tragically are locked behind bars and that we might even remember that Jesus came and walked among us and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news, but also to pray and claim the release of the captives. So yes, dear Lord, we could leave the jailhouse and go to the state house. There's a lot of places we could go and I'm not gonna go there right now with you, dear God, but you know what we need. So bless us now, dear Lord. We say this and all other prayers in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. And it's for his sake we all said together, amen. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Master, how shall we pray? And Jesus said to the disciples, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, Bye. 
I'm going to invite uh, the chair of our stewardship and finance committee to come forward. I didn't have to invite. She knew it was her, her turn. Come on, go, go ahead, Sally. You're not Sally. <laughs> There's a lot going on this morning. <laughs> For the dedication of the Yellow Rose gifts. Uh, and uh, we thank everyone that uh, uh, gave a gift uh, uh, in honor of someone. As I look down the list in the bulletin of those who gave and those who they honored, I just feel so much love that, uh, that people were expressing for those that they were remembering. Mark and I gave in remembrance of my grandmother, my mother's mother, Nana Binder. And uh, she, I think we were talking about the, uh, these gifts going to someone who'd influenced uh, us in our Christian walk. Well, um, I grew up, my family lived mostly on the East Coast, a little bit in the Midwest, and all my mother's family lived in Denver, Colorado. So every two years, my um, dad would give uh, us money to my mother and my sisters and I to take the train out to Denver and stay there for two weeks. Well, my uh, Nana was just so loving and she was so close to God. At least I, that's what I, I um, really felt at that time. And um, she, I had a lot of fears and anxiety as a child. And when I was out there for the two weeks, I was totally at peace. And I think it was a lot of my Nana's prayers for us and love for us. So, um, I think just uh, wonderful that we have Christian examples in our lives. And now um, Pastor Phil is going to dedicate the gifts. I need to echo um, Connie's remark about the love that she sees in these gifts. I, you know, went down the list. Um, and I'm not going to say, you know, the, you know, they all stood out and, you know, I don't know everybody, but, you know, they all stood out and some more than others uh, to me. Um, so I want to, you know, again, acknowledge the love that I see uh, in this list. Am I the only one that has this yellow piece of paper? We all? Okay. Okay. All right. Let us pray. Gracious God, we continue to say thank you for your love. But today, dear Lord, we must say thank you for your love and how this church family, members of this church family have, have expressed their love for one another, but also through their gift giving of money to the church endowment fund, they have expressed their love for your, for your church, for this church. They've expressed their love and concern and passion for your mission in the world, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, dear Lord, that we can, as we go forward, honor these gifts. But more importantly, dear Lord, honor the mission that you have given us as a church. We say this in all other prayers, in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, and it's for his sake, everyone says, Amen. Amen. At this point, um, we're going to have our call to offering, and I'll remind you that um, you can mail your gifts into the office or click the Give button on the uh, church's website. Um, and, um, you know, I'll be glad when we get back to just doing things like passing a plate and having ushers moving around and all of that. I have the sense that that's not far away but we can say a doxology now, amen. <laughs>
Dear God, whose giving knows no ending, we know how to say thank you when we receive. Right now, we say thank you as we give. In our giving, hear our heartfelt gratitude for all that you are and all that we have. Bless these gifts for your mission in the world and bless the other gifts we have to bring, opening our eyes to how you are calling us to be your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's sing the closing hymn, Amazing Grace. Forth and let us go forth into the world, giving thanks that we have come here. Let us go forth renewed in spirit, knowing that we belong to God, and God has taken eternal responsibility for each and every one of us. Let us go forth knowing that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and God's special procession. And let us go forth as witnesses, carrying the light of Jesus our Christ, and all the people said together, Amen. Amen. Amen.